The first release candidate for Next.js 15 is out, and that means that we get to take a look at all of the new features. They're really cool. Let me walk through a bunch of them step by step. Let's get right into it. All right, so here are the release notes for Next.js 15. Of course, all of this, these links are in the description right down below, so you can walk through this yourself. We're going to take a look first at the installation stuff. So if you have an existing project, then you can use this npm install to upgrade Next and React and React DOM to the release candidates. You can also get that information from the npm package manager. You can see the tag is rc, and that means 1500rc0. Cool. So I'm going to install that as a fresh new application. To do that, I'm going to use pmpm dlx. I'm going to use create next app. And instead of latest, I'm going to use what we just saw, rc. And I'm going to call this next 15 rc0. And of course, all the code at the end of this video is going to be uploaded to GitHub. You can check that out in the link right down below. A lot of these questions are straight out of 14. I'm going to take yes TypeScript, yes lint, tailwind, source directory, and the app router. This is the new one, TurboPack, so let's go for it. Let's uh, bring in TurboPack. This is new with the 15 release candidate. Apparently now TurboPack has 100% unit test coverage, which means they think it's ready for prime time, so let's try it out ourselves. No to the import alias customization. I'll bring that up in VS Code. Now that we got that going in VS Code, let's bring up the terminal and then just launch it. All right, that's started. Let's go take a look over our local host. All right, it seems that TurboPack is working. That's awesome. Let's check that off our list of things that we looked at. We also see the new landing page, which is also on their list of things that we should take a look at. So let's check that one off. That's down here in the Create Next App updates. We get a new design. I'm, I'm personally very appreciative of that because as I've been building out my Next.js course, pronextjs.dev, I've been launching this Create Next App continuously for months now, and I'm really happy that this boilerplate is a lot smaller. All right, back up to the top of the release notes. The first thing they mentioned is that they now are on the React 19 release candidate. Let's go take a look at a few of those features. What that means is that you can bring in some of the new hooks. For example, use action state. That's a new one on 19. There are a couple others, so we now have access to all of those. One of the really cool upgrades that I like to React 19 is the fact that you can put tags that are destined for the header in subcomponents. Let me demonstrate that for you. So if I go over here to the app and I create a new subcomponent, and I'll just create a simple subcomponent. So this will be like a product component. Now let's bring that into our page. Get rid of all this boilerplate. There we go. And we got my product. Now let's go over into our subcomponent again, and I'll add a meta tag, but I'll do it from this subcomponent. So I'll add a new meta component with the name of author and the content of Jack. Let's hit save. And now if I go to my view page source, we can now see that React 19 has grabbed that meta tag and actually inserted it into the head for us. This is really a fantastic DX upgrade for React 19. Let me explain why. So let's say you're accessing product data here in your page or in your subcomponent, and it has data that is destined for SEO tags. Well, before, you'd have to tunnel that all the way up to the layout, essentially, or have a metadata function that would go get that data for you. And so you'd have two different places where you'd be accessing that data. But now, because you can just go and put things like meta tags right into your subcomponents, you can just create the meta information right there and it gets put in the right place inside the head. Awesome. All right, let's go take a look at the next feature of Next15. That's the React Compiler. React Compiler was introduced at React Conf 2024, and it is now an experimental feature inside of Next.js. Of course, you can use the React Compiler in any framework, and it's important to know that it is not connected in any way to React 19. You can use it on React 18 if you so choose, but here they've just made it a lot easier to use it. Let's try it out. So to try it out, I think we should go first and create a component that is optimizable, see it unoptimized, and then use the compiler to optimize it. So we'll create a new optimizable counter. It's a counter, so it's going to use state, which means it needs to do a client component. All right, so I've created a div with a button where you can increment it. So I'm going to create a header subcomponent here. 
and use that as well. I'll give myself a little bit of margin. And then I'll use that in my component. All right, let's bring the optimizable counter into our page. So now the test rendering, I'm going to bring up in the Dev Inspector, the React Dev Tools for components. And what this is going to do is every time I click on a React component, it's going to show us what's actually re-rendering. So in this case, every time I click increment, you can see the subcomponent header is updating. But it really doesn't have to. Think about the code for a second. We go back over here. We can see that header doesn't depend on count. So theoretically, we could just cache or memoize header and then just reuse it every time. So that's actually what the compiler is going to do. Let's try it out. We'll go back over to our terminal, go into our release notes. We'll install the React compiler. And then over in our next config, we'll bring in the experimental React compiler. Now we run it. Now over in the browser, I'll click on increment, and we can see our subcomponent header is no longer updating. That's a sign that we are running on the compiler. We can actually just toggle it by just going over here and saying false. Now we can hit refresh, maybe a few times. And we'll hit increment again, and you can see that we are unoptimized. Change it back to true. And now we're optimized again. So easy. You can configure the compiler if you want, but honestly, I just stick with the defaults unless you really need something specific. All right, let's take a look at the next one, and that's around hydration errors. Yes, they're giving us better hydration errors. Let's go check it out. We'll create a new component called bad hydrating component. Now, because this deals with hydration and only client components are hydrated, we need to make this a client component. And then we need to give ourselves some data that is going to be different on the server than it is on a client. So I'm just going to use the time in milliseconds because that's guaranteed to be different between the server and the client. So let's create a new component here. I'll call it bad component. And I'll just get the milliseconds and display that. And then we'll bring that into our page. Hit save. And now we'll run it. So we got 515 as the second render on the client. Let's go take a look at our hydration error. Yes, we can see that on the client, we had 510 originally when we got 368 coming off the server. So we got a hydration error there and a really much improved hydration warning. All right, let's get that out of there because that's no fun. And let's take a look at the next one on the list. And we get into the caching updates. And this is really the big change when it comes to Next.js 15. What they've done is they've taken all of the caches that are in Next.js app router, and instead of having them on by default, they are now off by default, which I think is a huge DX upgrade for folks because I think a lot of folks ran into issues early on because the Next.js app router is so aggressively cached. And now you can get that caching if you need that performance, but you need to opt into it. Let's go take a look at a few examples. I'm actually going to do the fetch one second. We're going to start with is the get route handlers are no longer cached by default. So we'll go back here. We'll create a new app route. What? Time. And I'm going to create a get route here that returns the time. All right, we've got our API time that has a get method that returns the time. Let's go check that out. And now if I hit refresh, we can see that the time is changing on every refresh. Very cool. Now let's go try that out in build mode because that's where people got stung. There was a difference between dev mode and build mode. And so folks would think that their application was working in dev mode, and then they build it and they deploy it, and it wasn't working. Ah! So let's go see now if there's symmetric behavior in build mode. So first we're going to build, and then we're going to start. And yes, this is no longer cached, which is awesome. So by default in Next.js 14, if you had a Git route, then unless you looked at the incoming requests, like the headers or the cookies, or you made a fetch inside there that didn't have any caching on it, then the route was going to be static. But in this case, by default, it's going to be dynamic. We can actually see that in our terminal. So if we look back over here at the build, we can see the API time, which is the route that we just created, has a little F next to it. So let's go take a look at down at the key. The key says that that means that it's dynamic. So that means it's going to be fetched every single time from the server as opposed to what it used to be, which was static. 
So as you can see, what they're doing is it's changing the default. Now, if you wanted to make this static, what you could do is you could go and export a const that says dynamic, and then say for static. Now, if I rerun the same test, and I hit refresh, then that number never changes because now it is a static route. If I take a look at the build, we can see the API time now has an O on it, and that O, if we look at the legend, means that it is pre-rendered. So if you want that caching, you now have to opt into it. All right, let's take that out and try the changes to fetch. So if we look back at our release notes, we can see that fetch requests are no longer cached by default. So what does that mean? So let's go and take a look over here at our page. And we'll actually do a fetch request in here to go get that time. And then we'll get the time by awaiting that response. And then we'll just put that into a div. Now let me run this in dev mode. And we'll go back to our main route. Now we get the time, and the time actually does change. And this is different from before. It would have been locked in before, but again, not in dev mode. So it, again, one of those issues of dev mode works one way and build mode would work a different way. So let's try and build it and run it. Now this didn't work, and why didn't it work? Well, it had an issue all the way back up here where the fetch failed. And why did it fail? Because, well, we're not actually running when we're building and we're referring to ourselves, so that's not gonna work. So what we actually need to do is we need to go build a little bit of a timer service that we can talk to, kind of an external service. That would be the right way anyway. Next.js servers really shouldn't talk back to themselves like I'm doing here. So let me go build another little timer project inside of our project. It's an express server, and it will then go and give us our time in the same way. We'll call this one time service. We'll initialize the project, we'll add express, and then in there I'll create a server.js file. We'll bring in express. We'll respond to slash by giving you a time, and then we'll listen on port 8080. And then we'll put in a console that says we're listening on that port. Now let's go make another terminal and launch that. All right, looks good. Oops, I used date string, so that's not good. Let's do uh, UTC string. Is that gonna give us the whole thing? We want something that actually changes every hit. There we go, yeah, so that's gonna give us one every second. That's, that's fine. Okay, cool, so now I've got a little service that we can talk to that's running. Let's go back over to our app page. We'll hit 8080 this time. We just need slash. Let's try it in dev mode. All right, good. Looks like it's getting it from the new service. That's awesome. And now let's actually build and run it. And now, theoretically, this actually should work, but it's not. It's still cached. So why is that? Well, currently the route is marked as static. So what we need to do is force this route to be dynamic. All right, let's try that again. All right, we hit refresh, and there we go. Now we're getting the updates. Now I gotta say, I shouldn't have had to go and set that force dynamic. The reason is that Next.js, during the build process, it looks at the fetch to see, is this a cached fetch or not? And if it's not a cached fetch, then it should set the route to be dynamic, but it's not doing that. So I think that's actually a bug. But if I wanted this to be cached, Then I set the cache to force cache, and now try that. Now let's take a look at the build. The slash route is dynamic, so we're gonna get a new page on every request, but we're not going to get new data because that fetch has been cached. All right, there's one more cache that they changed the defaults on, and that is the client router cache. The client router cache is for when you navigate between pages on the client. They used to save the old page and then give it back to you, and that tripped, a f I think, a few folks up, although I think in reality they were actually getting tripped up by the router cache, but whatever. If that cache tripped you up, then you'd be happy to know that it is now off by default, but you can set it back on if it didn't trip you up and you wanted that performance benefit by going and setting the experimental flag as they say here.
Now they're pushing on with their partial pre-rendering feature. That is an awesome feature of Next.js. Gives you the ability to actually pre-render the app shell and then send that out to the client super quickly out of an edge function. What this is allowing you to do is create incremental adoption of partial pre-rendering. You can select per route which routes you want to be partially pre-rendered, which is really awesome. So very happy to see that here. Next up, we get this new feature called Next After. It allows you to add a function that's run after the route runs. Not sure why I'd need this, but let's give it a try anyways. Maybe you have an idea and you can put that in the comments section right down below. So we'll set on the experimental after. We'll run in dev mode. And now I can bring in unstable after as after. And then anywhere in my component, I can just say after and then give it a callback function. And I can say that I've finished rendering. So now if I go back over to my app, hit refresh, and now we can see that we get my finished rendering console log. So that's really cool. I guess what I could do is maybe set a time up here and then give the delta time down there to tell me how long it took to render my page. Who knows? All right, next up, we've got our Create Next App updates. I mentioned those in the beginning. And then for all you build optimization folks, there are some optimizations when it comes to bundling and external packages. It gives you finer grain control about what you transpile and what you just bring in as external. All right, that's what's coming out in Next.js 15, at least according to the first release candidate. If you want to keep up on all things Next.js, be sure to jump on to pronextjs.dev, sign up for my newsletter. That'll give you access to two free tutorials, one on state management, the other on forms management. And you'll know when the course comes out. We are just in the final phases of it right now, doing the final edits. I'm so happy, and I can't wait to get that out to you. In the meantime, of course, if you like this video, hit the like button. If you really like the video, hit the subscribe button and click on that bell. You'll be notified the next time a new blue-collar coder comes out.